Okay, so good evening, everybody who's attending tonight. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Edinburgh Users Group meeting for 2021. Um, I'm very glad to welcome here uh, two to amazing speakers tonight. Uh, the first one is Alberto Arcagni. Uh, we go way back. <laughs> I think we were uh, we we did our PhD together, and I was thinking about it today. It was I think 14 years ago we started. Okay, I'm starting <laughs> to feeling old. Yeah. So Alberto is uh, is an assistant professor in statistics at uh, the University La Sapienza in Rome, and uh, his research is mostly focused on uh, income inequality and well-being. And he also has uh, a nice body of work on networks and partially ordered sets. Alberto authored and maintains uh, three packages on CRAN, um, uh, and he will talk to us about one of them tonight, specifically the one about partial yours. Uh, our second speaker tonight is Jonathan Sidi, uh, Uni. Um, hi, Uni, thanks for joining us from the US. Um, so, uh, Yoni started using R uh, about 15 years ago uh, while he was studying at the Bank of Israel. And now he's uh, Associate Director of Modeling and Simulation in a pharmaceutical company that uses R every day to model central nervous dis system diseases. He maintains, I, I understand, a lot of packages, and <laughs> both on, the, on CRAN and on GitHub. So um, without further ado, um, I will let Alberto uh, take the floor and start. Uh, we'll have the two talks in sequence, and I... I would gladly, I would, I would kindly ask you to keep your questions for the end. You can either write them in the chat. Mike will uh, take care of uh, writing them down and make sure that no one gets lost, or uh, you can, uh, you can open the mic at the end and and just ask away. Okay, so Alberto, um, the floor is yours. You have uh, approximately 25 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Federico, for introducing me. Hello to everyone. And uh, I start sharing my screen and uh, immediately start my presentation um, because Federico, you just introduced me. So uh, my talk, the talk, uh, my talk tonight is uh, about uh, a package I started develop, developing uh, in uh, 2016. And uh, it is uh, an application of uh, partially ordered sets in the uh, social economic sciences. Um, so I, oops, sorry. Okay, uh, I will uh, explain you uh, just the main functions um, of uh, this package that are listed here. But uh, uh, I can show you also that. Uh, uh, the package uh, contains uh, a, a lot of, of uh, other functions uh, that are listed here in the in the uh, manual, and um, uh, I choose the, uh, to show you this uh, the, the fun these functions, uh, this one so in particular the last one that is strictly related uh, with uh, the. Uh, uh, last development of the methodologies uh, I proposed together another colleague from the University of Milano Bicocca, Marco Fattore. So, uh, before showing you uh, the behavior of these uh, art functions, I, sh I, I think I have introduced you uh, the uh, the mathematical aspects, uh, the mathematical definitions of uh, uh, a partially ordered set. So, uh, what a partially ordered set is? It is a pair of, uh, composed by a, a set X and an order relation. Uh, this order relation is nothing else than a binary relation that is Refre ref reflexive, antisymmetric, and transitive. Uh, so uh, we, uh, uh, Marco Fattore, thought to apply this uh, mathematical structure to sets uh, of ordinal variables. So uh, consider that you have key different uh, ordinal uh, variables, 
and uh, uh, consider the set of, profi of profiles, uh, the Cartesian product uh, of their supports. So, uh, some profiles uh, are com comparable, some other not. Uh, and uh, the set of profiles together with the, um, the uh, order relation I will explain to you late, uh, uh, just a few, uh, in a few moments, uh, it, is, it composes a partially ordered set. In particular, this parti um, partially ordered set is called product order. So, uh, here there is the main reference of uh, the article published by Marco Fattore, uh, where he um, explained this idea. So, a product order, it is a, a, it is a partially ordered set. Uh, so, uh, the set uh, that defines uh, a product order is the Cartesian product of, uh, the, or, of the sets of, of, of the original partially ordered sets. Then, uh, the, we can impose a coordinate-wise order relation uh, that is defined in this way, but I, I, I prefer to explain you uh, this um, order relation through uh, an example. So, imagine you have a key uh, equal to four ordinal variables, and for instance, these uh, ordinal variables are uh, binary, uh, so they can assume the value 0, 0 and 1 uh, to uh, identify the absence and the presence of something that is de desirable. So, um, this uh, can be uh, the result of uh, a, a source uh, about uh, the sun, uh, deprivations, okay? So, when uh, all the four variables are equal to zero, we can say that uh, we identify a profile of uh, a, a statistical unit that is deprivated of all the four uh, de uh, desirable uh, uh, characteristics. And uh, so on, this is the Cartesian product, and this graphical representation is called as diagram. Um, that represents the uh, cover relation whose uh, uh, transitive uh, closure is the order relation I defined uh, you before. Uh, so we can say that uh, a, a profile covers another one if it is connected from the top to the bottom uh, by in uh, this uh, network, we can say, uh, in this network. And uh, uh, if there is a path from uh, the top to the bottom, there is uh, a comparability between the profiles. So this uh, uh, profile is uh, uh, preferred to this profile because we can identify this path. So before talking you, uh, to you about the frequency distributions on a, on a posit, and the fuzzy first order dominance, uh, that is another uh, topic, uh, methodological topic, I show you uh, the package. The, uh, how to obtain this uh, result with the package uh, I've developed. So the, the package is called the PARSEC, that uh, means uh, partial orders in socioeconomics. You can call it and then the first uh, function I show you is uh, this uh, function that is called get lambda that uh, allows you uh, introducing a, a list of uh, um, a num uh, not defined number of arguments. Here you can list all the comparabilities between elements into the partially ordered set you want to define. So, note that uh, not, uh, no characters, uh, no uh, not, uh, strings are required, 
this is due to the fact uh, uh, that I have uh, introduced the sum uh, instruction at the beginning of the definition of this uh, get lambda uh, function that uh, uh, parse uh, the call of uh, the function. So when we run uh, this uh, code, the, the result is uh, a, a comparability matrix that uh, uh, identifies um, the uh, partial order, the, uh, the order relation. So you can observe that it is binary, a binary relation, because we have uh, uh, logical values in the matrix. It is uh, uh, reflexive, or the, the mean diagonal is equal to true. Antisymmetric, when a, um, uh, when we have a true in a, in a combination line column, uh, it is necessary equal to false uh, in the transposed uh, element and uh, it is transitive and uh, i don't i don't think i need to explain to you the transitivity the relation how we how can we interpret this uh, matrix uh, we can say that the element in the row is cov uh, is uh, uh, lower than the element lower or equal because it is reflexive lower or equal to the element in the column. So, uh, now I show you that I have created a method for the plot function that realizes uh, the, uh, the acid diagram. And uh, in particular, uh, I explained to you that uh, the acid diagram shows uh, it is a, a network a, an oriented network, in particular a directed cyclic graph um, that uh, shows you the cover relation. And its uh, transitive closure is uh, the order relation. So with the incidence to cover function, you get the cover relation, and then with the plot, uh, with the plot method, you get uh, the asset diagram. So if uh, you compare the results with the uh, comparabilities we introduced at the beginning, you can observe that D is greater than C, uh, A, is, uh, A is, is lower than B, and by tra uh, transitivity we can also observe that D is greater than A. So uh, if you check in uh, in this, uh, in the incidence matrix, in the, that uh, describe the um, the cover, uh, uh, the comparability relations, um, you can observe that A is it is uh, always lower than all the other elements, with the exception of the element E that is not comparable with uh, uh, any other element. <laughs> so, um, I show you now another function I have introduced in this package that is, co that is called LE. It, it stays for linear extensions. What uh, linear extensions are? Uh, linear extensions are extensions of uh, deposit. So, uh, uh, deposit uh, is defined by the uh, the comparability uh, relation. Uh, sorry, it is better if I show you this plot. Uh, the comparability relation. We can extend deposit uh, in inserting, uh, including more comparabilities. And, and this is called the extension of a posit. A linear extension of a posit is an extension that uh, um, has so much comparabilities that is a complete order. So from this posit, we can define these one, two, three, 
um, 15 linear extensions. So all these complete orders are uh, includes all these comparabilities and have some some more uh, some comparability more. Um, now we can also uh, talk now now we can also talk about the uh, uh, the mutual ranking probability matrix. <laughs> Uh, you can observe that in a linear extension, uh, you have uh, uh, all the elements are compar comparable. And then, uh, for instance, you can observe that in um, this linear extension, uh, E is greater than D. In this linear extension, D is greater than E. In uh, this other one, E is uh, greater than D and so on. We can uh, check the relative frequencies inside the set of linear extensions to um, and, uh, the relative uh, frequencies of all the comparabilities inside the set of linear extensions. Uh, and this matrix, the mutual ranking probability matrix, um, returns to you these relative frequencies. For instance, for two-thirds of the linear extensions, uh, C is lower than B, and so on. Lower or equal, because uh, here we have also the diagonal that is equal to one. This uh, is another matrix that is really useful to describe uh, the partial order set. Now, uh, I started developing this package in 2016, as I already told, um, and uh, at the beginning, I use it for other goals. So, to introduce uh, this matrix, I used uh, another, uh, I inserted the, the dependencies from another package that is called the NetRanker. And that returns a, a result that is similar, and I just adapted it to uh, the, uh, in, uh, the what uh, I need for what we need for the methodology. Uh, I introduced also another dependency uh, because uh, to. Uh, for the graphical representation of networks uh, is a uh, more uh, famous, uh, the package iGraph. So I created a function that uh, uh, is called uh, parsec to a graph that uh, uh, convert an object, a, a comparability matrix into a, a, a graph object of the package iGraph. So we can use the methods of the package I graph for the graphical representation of the acid diagrams. Here you can observe the direction of the comparabilities. And here uh, I uh, set as default the layout I realized for the previous graphical representation. But uh, um, in the... Um, then I also uh, observed that in the uh, iGraph package already exists a, lay a particular layout that is thought for directed acyclic graphs. That is uh, the graphs that are used to represent the cover relation. So if we try to modify this layout, we get this result that is still uh, a, a, an aster diagram. So uh, we can use also this layout of the graph package for the graphical representation and to realize the aster diagram. And it is again, we have the comparabilities from the top to the bottom. And the simply, and the incomparable elements are. Uh, located at the top of the graph, uh, but you can simply observe that they are not comparable with an, uh, no other ones uh, uh, elements of the posit. 
Now, um, I uh, show you uh, any, a function that uh, I introduced at the, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the development of this uh, package that uh, identifies from a data frame of uh, at least uh, uh, comparable variables uh, so uh, we we need uh, um, ordered factors or numerical variables so here i show you a, a simulation so uh, starting from this uh, starting from this simulation you can observe for instance i realize that 100 you can think uh, about to uh, 100 observations. Well, uh, for each observation, we have different uh, uh, profiles. So uh, we can use this function that is called the population to profiles, uh, is the short for the population to profiles, to, uh, uh, to uh, summarize the, the data frame into an object of class weighted profiles that returns all the observed profiles with the uh, correspective uh, absolute frequency. So, uh, for instance, um, we can uh, get the, uh, the correspondent asset diagram uh, sorry, uh, this. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, we, we can get the correspondent uh, asset diagram of all the observed profiles, and this is was the original goal of the package. <laughs> I don't explain you uh, what this uh, this function does. But I want to underline then that when I started developing this package, uh, the uh, stable release of the RCPP uh, package was not uh, already developed. So, uh, and to um, run this function, this, uh, this uh, instruction is particular compute, computational intensive. So I tried to realize a C++ library using the R APIs because it was the 2016 and I didn't already know the RCPP package. Uh, this is just uh, so an observation about the development of the package. Now, uh, I obtained a function that is a particular uh, efficient. And here there are some other plots about this methodology, but uh, at, at the moment it is it too, too much time expensive to describe what this particular function does. And we can say also that this methodology uh, now has been improved with something new. Um, now I show you how to get uh, the uh, product order I, I, I already I showed you here in this example. So, uh, instead of the function population to profiles, we can use the function variables to profiles, where we have to list all the variables with their uh, modalities. And we can use both uh, numerical uh, uh, modalities or we can also use uh, ordered factors. So we can just list uh, uh, these uh, the variables with the uh, values of zero and one as I described you before. And uh, uh, the result, uh, is another list of the, in this case, all the possible profiles and the correspondent, uh, the, the correspondent frequencies 
are all equal to 1. And now that we have these profiles, we can observe the correspondent axis diagram. Now we can go back to the presentation and now you can imagine a, a frequency distribution of, uh, on this set of possible profiles. So, uh, for instance, here we have a table with uh, all the possible profiles and uh, the uh, correspondent absolute frequencies for three different distributions, uh, for, for three different populations. And here we have the, co uh, the correspondent graphical representation where the uh, uh, color is uh, more intense in, uh, propo uh, in proportion with the relative frequency. So, uh, the goal of the new methodology related to uh, the uh, partially ordered set is trying to compare these uh, populations. Here, we can, uh, I already described you the toy example, and uh, we can, we already uh, observed that in this profile, we have the uh, most depri uh, deprived uh, situation. And with this profile, so we have uh, the, the situation where the well-being is higher. And here we have uh, some other situations that some one are comparable, some other not. Just uh, looking at the images, we can we can imagine that uh, the uh, the population A is uh, uh, less uh, uh, the well-being in the population A is higher than the population B, but uh, we cannot compare the population C with the other two. And how to get some uh, some indicators to compare these uh, populations? We uh, started uh, in uh, developing, uh, the, uh, in uh, realizing this um, methodology, thinking in the case we were in the continuous unidimensional case. In the continuous uh, unidimensional case, there is the first order dominance. And if we were in the uh, continuous, uh, in particular in the unidimensional case, we can imagine that uh, since the distribution A is less uh, deprived, uh, the behavior in the population A is higher than uh, the behavior in the population B, we can imagine that uh, the uh, cumulative distribution function of the population A is uh, at the right of the uh, cumulative distribution function of the population B. And, the, uh, and the, we can also imagine that the population C is not com comparable with the um, other two distributions. And so we can imagine that the cumulative distribution uh, of uh, the population C intersects the other two uh, cumulative distribution. So, uh, I already uh, introduced you to complete orders, in particular linear extensions, and uh, the idea is to consider all the possible uh, linear extensions and using, uh, and for each linear extension evaluates the cumulative distribution of uh, each population. And after we um, compared all the cum cumulative distribution of each population, uh, we, um, we get uh, an average result uh, uh, over the set of all the possible linear uh, extensions. 
So this uh, can be a, an example of the particular linear extension. Now it is from the left to the right. This profile, uh, the right profile is the, uh, the, the one where the well being is higher than the left one. And uh, um, this is exactly the result we get of the cumulative distribution functions of the three uh, distributions I showed you at the beginning of the example. So, uh, moreover, we use also a fuzzy approach. Uh, so, we don't, we don't simply say, is, uh, say uh, if uh, a distribution dominates another one, but we evaluate the probability that an element of uh, the distribution uh, of one distribution uh, take, uh, uh, taken randomly from the uh, distribution eight dominates another element uh, taken from another distribution inside a particular linear relation lambda. Then we uh, get the average over the set of all the linear extensions. And the result is the delta matrix that returns the probability that an element randomly taken from the population A is dominated by another element taken randomly from the population B uh, over all the set of the possible uh, linear extensions. So uh, this uh, problem, uh, this uh, uh, topic, uh, excuse me? Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, two. I'm sorry, Federico, how many minutes? Two more minutes. Okay, thank you. So I conclude. So there is a problem of complexity. Um, and so um, we can use a Monte Carlo Markov chain or uh, use another a subset of linear extension that I don't explain to you <laughs> that can be used in particular with um, the case of product orders. And now I show you the results, uh, how to get these results with the DR package. So here I read the distribution from a CSV file. So you can observe that these are exactly the distribution I show you in the slides. Here, uh, you can uh, use again uh, the plot uh, method and using the uh, ground argument to fill with the different colors uh, the uh, elements of the posit, uh, the elements in the asset diagram. Um, here we have the comparability metric, the um, incidence metrics I described you before. Uh, then um, the mutual ranking probability metrics evaluated on this subset that is called of uh, lexicographical linear extensions. And here see, uh, we get the delta matrix uh, that returns um, uh, the delta matrix that is uh, one of the main results of the fuzzy first order domino methodology and that is developed with uh, uh, that is uh, evaluated with the pod function all you have to give to the to this function is the uh, set uh, the list of all the possible profiles and the corresponding data set data frame with the different distributions. So here we have the delta matrix, and here, for instance, we can say that we have a 37% of probability that an element randomly taken from the distribution C is lower or equal than an element randomly taken from the distribution B. And if we remove the main diagonal and we get the average value by column and observe, uh, we get 
some uh, an indicator that allows you to sort the distributions. So we can say that um, uh, the distribution A of had had an indicator higher than all the other uh, distributions. The distribution B uh, uh, returned the lowest result. That was the I recall you just the the acid diagrams. So the distribution A obtained the highest result. The distribution B the lowest, and the, the distribution C that is more uh, sparse on uh, the domain in the value into the middle. Okay, I finished. I can interrupt, uh, close my presentation, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Alberto. A so full of the time. Let me stretch on to Tony. Um, Hello. Yes. So I will share my screen. Thank you, your name. The floor is okay. yours. Thank you, my screen. Yes, perfect. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Yanni Sidi. Um, I'm gonna be talking about unit testing Shiny App Reactivity. Um, in a package called Reactor. So the motivation for this package. Um, many times uh, the ability to diagnose and resolve uh, cascading reactivity in Shiny, which can be defined as one piece of a Shiny app uh, triggering another piece and then unintentionally triggering more and more pieces of a Shiny app, until the full invalidation is over. Uh, that can be very uh, time consuming and uh, waste resources, uh, creating bad user experiences. Um, for people who've made um, big, uh, relatively big Shiny apps, that, that pops up a lot in Shiny. So for this, we're gonna go through the framework of unit testing where a quick definition of unit testing is a it's a framework to improve the collaboration across multiple developers where we test basic assumptions or expectations of how the code works we use this in our package development uh, a lot it's it's a uh, common thing now um, thanks to our studio and, and a lot of uh, people that work on um, package development and in Shiny applications, the ability to diagnose and resolve these reactivity problems through unit testing is lacking currently. So the solution is a package called Reactor. And what this does, it is a package that you can both drive an application and set up expectations of what happens when you are um, driving an application, which I'll explain in a minute. You can find it at uh, the GitHub page, Yanni CD slash Reactor. So how does Reactor fit in with other packages in the uh, R universe? So there's basically three uh, main packages that are currently, that can currently do similar things that Reactor does. Um, first, I'll start on the right-hand side, Shiny Test Server. It's a built-in uh, testing area uh, in Shiny where you can create Shiny modules to test environments to verify rea reactive outputs as they are expected. It doesn't actually check if the reactivity is, is being triggered correctly. It's just checking that the output is being created correctly. Next, Shiny Test, that's a package that checks the inputs in the, in the UI behavior of a Shiny app. It, it integrates well with test that and continuous integration. And a new package, Shiny Jester, with JSTer, which is JavaScript testing on Shiny applications. It's pretty new uh, in our studio, and it 
you have to be a very well versed in JavaScript in order to use it, which is a pretty high threshold for our users at the moment. What Reactor, the difference with the Reactor is that it is testing whether your reactivity is staying uh, consistent as you update or change your application. So to start off, uh, load, you load Reactor and you initialize the object, the Reactor object. This is not an R6 object. Uh, it's similar to R6, but uh, for different reasons, uh, I chose not to go down the R6 path in this. I chose instead to do S3 method notation, which I think is more uh, more applicable to a wider audience than R6 at the moment. So we create this initial re init reactor, and there's two slots that are created, empty slots for you. First the application is where you set the Shiny app that you want to use. You can either use Golem or a Golem package for it, or you can use just a raw Shiny app. And driver, that's the specifications for the web driver uh, through R Selenium that will be used in order to, to host the app. So as I said, application for the application, the way, because this is S3, we can just pipe in the output, the, the inputs. So taking that same object that we had before, we're gonna pipe in and set the run app args with an app directory or a Golem application. So again, object, pipe it through and give the name of the package. And that, and that is, going to set up the application. So what does it look like in practice? So here's a little workflow uh, for Reactor. So first there's a the parent set the parent R session for Reactor. You set the Shiny app or Golem. That is gonna be activated through a process X child session, which is all behind the scenes for you. You don't actually know have to know how to do this. It's gonna be hosted on a local host, and the Shiny app is gonna be served. The settings in the Reactor object itself are the basic information that is needed in order to run this workflow. So you need a port, a path uh, to run in, on disk, IP, and if you wanna turn on Shiny Trace or not in order to have more control over the over the guts of the, the app itself. And the app dir is the path to the app itself. Next, the driver. So once we have an application here, we're gonna need to set up the web driver that is gonna interact with the Shiny app itself. So we're gonna be sending commands through the web driver to the Shiny app that's already uh, defined in the workflow. And I'm gonna introduce a new concept here called where am I log, which we'll put a button in that for a second, but um, that is where the reactivity is gonna be logged. To do this, right now, you can either set a Chrome driver, so you're taking the same object, you're adding a Chrome settings with the set Chrome driver, um, we can replace that with a Firefox or Gecko uh, web driver. When you do this, if there's already a, a web driver defined for the object, you, you set the new one, it's gonna give you a message that it's replacing the old with the Chrome with the Firefox and vice versa. You can also pass options into the driver. For example, if you wanna, um, turn off headless mode and see the the browser while you are interacting with the app, you can do that um, through the options. So now we have our specifications in place in the reactor object and now we want to start it. To do that, 
pretty simple. You just do start reactor, um, and then you are ready to go. Side note for people who are familiar with uh, uh, Puppeteer packages, C R R R I and Cry, um, Reactor will work with them in much the same way. So if you're not if you're not comfortable with, with R Selenium, there's always uh, the option of working with Cry. So now we have the object, and now we want to, and we're hosting it, and now we want to interact with the application while it's running. So there's two options that are set up. Again, this is an S3 method. So what we're going to, what happens is that once you start the reactor, you can pipe in, pipe that object into um, different verbs. So you can inject JavaScript or you can query the app. So you can set an ID value. So let's say you have an ID of uh, like, uh, uh, um, some UI object that you have with an ID. You can set the value of it, like a slider, for example. Or if you want to, if you're a bit more advanced and you want to uh, just call raw JavaScript, you can call execute, and the, that will run the JavaScript for you. On the other side, we can query the app itself. So there's a few nice functionalities here where you can query all the input names of the app, so you don't have to keep them in your head all the time. You can just query them while the app is running. That will also catch if you need um, the render UI. So if a UI is being created for you as you are running, you can also query that in real time. You can query an input ID, which returns the value of a Shiny input. You can also query the output names and the query and return the value of an output ID. So let's say a plot. You want to see that the source of a plot is staying consistent. Query output ID will help you will help you do that. You can also query with raw JavaScript, and that is a bit more advanced. Closing reactor. So just like reactor start, we can run kill app, which is a safe way to close the reactor. This will close both child processes. One is the Shiny app itself, so the other the web driver, and it cleans up any side effects that are created in the temporary directory. To make this a bit more uh, hands-on, uh, I created a, a little toy application. So this is a very basic application where you have two UI elements. So numeric input, input n, which a user can change, and a plot output showing the histogram of our uniform, uh, random uniform numbers with the input n as the, as the sample size. <clears throat> On the server side, we'll add a new element for logging reactivity using the where am I package. So this is the app, it's very small, very simple. Uh, you have the uh, UI output n, plot output plot, and this odd line of where am I? What what does that do? How does that help us? So where am I is a package that logs the locations where commands in an R session were invoked and their source location. And in a Shiny app, this is very important. So we can place uh, where am I with a tag, which will differentiate between different placements of this logger. So I can have multiple tags, and they will all be logged at, uh, independently while the app is running. That's the reason there's a tag here. So every time the, the rendering application hits a line in the code, you're going to, if you have a cat where, it will print out to the console, render plot, and the line that it happened. So this is a, an example. So here we have that app running. And you see every time the input n changes, the plot is being re-rendered. So 
it's the console is being printed out every time that happens. So this is a way to, in real time, log reactivity that is happening on that. Um, not long ago, uh, I think last week, Colin Fay um, created an app to make the have this work uh, as an example. So here I'm clicking the buttons. Is where am I called within the script here? And every time I hit a button, a histogram is being updated of the actual hits. And this is what's being printed out to the console. So here I hit the first button three times. Uh, sorry. I hit module two four times, module one once, and module three twice. Because Reactor is based off of S3, as I said a few times already, um, this creates a way to create pipelines of of uh, of interacting with the app. So I can, in all the same pipeline, I can in, initialize a reactor object, set the, set the app, set the Chrome, set a driver for the web driver, start the reactor, manipulate twice. So I'm setting the ID value of this, this field twice, once to 500, once to 300, and then I'm closing the app. So here you can see that you can start to manipulate the app in a very fluid way, an iterative way, much like you would do with dplyr or things like that, where you're iterating over different scenarios that you want to do. Now we move on to expectations. So here we have the command query with the web driver. That is hitting the Shiny app. And every time we trip a line with where am I, it's getting logged. And that log, we can test expectations against it. So here, the same pipeline that I had before, I set the ID value to 500. I expect that the plot will be rendered once, the first time. After that, if I set the value again, that counter should be at two at that point. So I can expect that reactivity. Many times in more complicated apps, there could be different chunks that are reactive that are affecting uh, a plot, making it render twice or three times without you even noticing, or worse, you notice and you try to figure out why it's doing it. So this is a way to, to make it more uh, expectation-based. Another type of expectation that Reactor has is actually testing the busy time that Chiny is working on, on uh, invalidating after some interaction. So this could be for a single interaction, or you could uh, start to accumulate the time, and uh, Reactor will keep a log of busy times that, as you accumulate them. And at the end of the app, when you're interacting with it, you can actually test against that expected time. So if, Let's say you have some kind of uh, a reactive uh, chain that you know is going to take five or ten seconds. If you change something in the app, and it's a pretty big app, you could be making a mistake or a change that causes it to work for 20 seconds instead of the ten that you expect. So this is a way to test against that and guard against problems. So let's say we we take that app that we had. Originally, so if if you have your output plot defined as shiny render plot and hist uh, stats unif input n, this is going to be a problem because every time the input n is changed or invalidated, the plot is going to be re-rendered every time. There's nothing holding uh, shiny back from re reinvalidating re that every time. And especially at the in, for this example, in the initialization, you're going to be hitting that plot twice initially when the app opens up, and then again when you're manipulating 
uh, the, the, the select input. A way to fix that would be to use shiny rec input in. And what this does, it forces uh, input in to be uh, in the shiny environment and, cha and, um, and changed when, if, if you're gonna render the plot. That way you're more in control about what you are uh, rendering and when. This is a bit different also than things like observe event or event reactive, where observe event is not recommended uh, to be used in such, an, in such a scenario because your shiny creates internally a lot of objects every time observe event is triggered. So it's not an efficient way to code in shiny. Now we wanna integrate that test that we have into a test that environment. So um, a way to do this, so this is test that, just like packages or anything else. So I'm creating an, that same object, so I'm initializing, initializing Reactor using Firefox and setting the app. So this, this is still just a, a shell with a lot of preferences listed inside of it. So I can reuse this as long as I don't run over object, the object, it's gonna, every time I start a pipe with it, it's gonna start from this position. And that way I can run uh, multiple tests using that same object. So I can use that object, start reactor, set the ID value to 500, and then expect that counter to be at two, and then close the app. And then I can move on and do another expectation exactly the same way, the object start reactor, do my, do my expectations, and then kill the app again. So I can reuse this object as many times as I want. Directory structure, um, the test file for reactor is set up the same, exactly the same as we saw for test that, except that the name, uh, the naming of it is a bit different. Instead of a prefix test, we're gonna have a prefix reactor for this. This serves a few purposes. First, uh, it isolates the reactivity, so you can call them uh, regardless of if you have, let's say, a Golem app and you have a package that is hosting your Shiny app, you can run these reactivity tests independent of the code testing of the, of the package itself, which is a bit more versatile. Second of all, cover uh, it doesn't work well in, in, uh, with Reactor. It just, they serve two different purposes. So cover is, uh, will run on test prefixes. This is a way to get out of cover. And Reactor, to call these tests, we would just run test app so you have uh, a simple way in order to invoke the test. And this is how, this is how it looks in the console. So you get information when you're running it that it's attempting to connect to the app. It takes an X amount of time to, con to connect. <clears throat> the battery activity, we're expecting two, we get three hits. And then we're testing against the good app. And we passed the test. And that's it. It looks exactly the same as test that. And finally, continuous integration. So when working with in version control or collaboration, continuous integration is very important. So this is um, kind of new for Shiny, I think, that this allows for collaboration across uh, development in a Shiny app. So if I have, if I'm working with myself, let's say, if I change something in my Shiny app, I wanna be able through continuous integration to know that I didn't break any expectations that I had. Or if someone creates a pull request to my app, um, this is a way for me as the maintainer to guard against anything that would break based on any pull request that is created.
and that's uh, the way that it looks in GitHub Actions. That's it. So what Reactor gives you, it simplifies diagnosing reactivity issues in Shiny, creates a framework to store and reproduce testing of Shiny apps, can be applied in continuous integration, and creates safer Shiny app development practices for teams to collaborate. Thanks. Thank you, Yoni. Very, very interesting. And okay, so uh, we are running uh, quite on time. Uh, it's time for some questions uh, from the stage. I see there's a couple already typed in the chat. We, Mike and myself, have collected a few of them. Um, is there anybody else who wants to to ask a question? Please let us know through the chat. So the first question. Um, Let's let's ask Yoni. So uh, there's a question. Uh, this is super useful, but it's a lot to take in. Uh, I agree. It's, it, it is actually a, a lot. Uh, which one thing would you recommend starting with um, when when going about using your package to assist testing and 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 set up a, a better pipeline and better for work? Sure. So um, one place here I can share my again um, so first off um, a good place to start would be um, when when you have uh, rendering chunks in your in your app you can place where am I uh, to see that they're not being hit multiple times. So a simple way would be um, here. What I had here up here. So this is a simple example. So here I can put in this where am I call and I can have it print out to the console. So first of all, that that will give me feedback to how many times that plot is being rendered. I don't have to know anything about a reactor at all for that, but it's a way to start to get a feeling of is my app actually doing what I'm what I think it's doing under the hood. So that's that's uh, feedback that I would get right away. Then once I have that that understanding that. I want that plot to render only once. I can build a, a expectation around that, that assumption. And that is as simple as just having this call here, where I manipulate the, the size of the histogram to a different number, and that, that should be enough to start off. So that, that that would be a good starting off point, just to see how is 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 the is the shiny app actually doing what it what's it intended to do? Thanks, Yoni. That's a very nice suggestion. Um, let's move on to Alberto. So, uh, Alberto, can you give some examples of applications of posits? You have mentioned uh, deprivation or um, income distribution in your in your presentation, but is there any other thing you have been working on or that you know they are working on using these posits models? Yeah, uh, just for the application, we uh, I listed some uh, article we published uh, in the references. And uh, for instance, uh, I can uh, cite uh, uh, the main article that uh, introduced the, the fuzzy first order dominance uh, in partial orders. That uh, uh, contains an application uh, in the study of uh, in, uh, in the the well-being of child uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Moreover, we applied also this uh, methodology to compare the to analyze the poverty and the expect and the um, fragility of. Uh, 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 in the, to compare the Italian regions uh, in, uh, in terms of 
poverty and uh, fragility in particular of, of uh, immigrated population. Okay, thank you. And, uh, so, uh, I can say that uh, uh, this uh, orders uh, uh, takes application in uh, all uh, the fields where you you have uh, a survey with the ordinal variables, uh, more than one ordinal variable, obviously. And uh, about the package, thank you for asking this because uh, I forgot to say that uh, now we are uh, developing a, a new package uh, together with another professor of the uh, University of Milano Bicocca, an, uh, an informatic professor that is uh, all uh, realized uh, with uh, our CPP. And uh, uh, we uh, don't uh, use any more uh, Netranker, but uh, we, in, uh, as I showed you before, for the graphical uh, representation, and also for some calculus, uh, we uh, integrated more uh, the uh, iGraph package. iGraph package, yeah. And uh, um, so, uh, and also it is more structured because uh, we have an RC, uh, a C library, a CPP library, uh, used to uh, sample from the set of all the linear extensions, and you can apply all the functions you desire, also are defined functions, uh, on this set of linear extensions. Okay, thank you very much, thank Roberto. You. Uh, Yoni, there's one last question for you, which is uh, by Chris, and is there any overhead or side effects for all the calls to where am I? No, uh, basically none, because it's using the stack, the, the stack of R, so it's querying the stack that's being created anyway, and uh, that's an internal function of R, and it's... Uh, Internally in where am I itself, there's an environment that's holding all of the of the logging. So um, there's nothing really in in your global environment that's going to be used up for that. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, would you reckon this would still hold true even for larger applications, given the fact that it's using the R stack rather than uh, the internal um, shiny app uh, environment? No, I've used them. Uh, I've tested it on uh -huh. uh, okay. one that, that had 30 of them, and <laughs> I didn't feel anything. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> but it's just a list. It's just a list. It's not. It's it's a tiny list in the end. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any other question from uh, from those who are still here with us? Okay. So. Um, Join me in thanking again our uh, our speakers, uh, Alberto and Yoni. Thanks, thanks for being our first speakers of the year, and um, we'll be we'll be in touch. The recording will be uploaded on YouTube in a matter of a few days. Um, uh, we'll 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 advertise that. So if you want to go and look at your faces again, <laughs> then free to. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks to those who have attended this meeting. Thanks, Mike, for Thank taking you. care of technical aspects. And uh, we see you next month. Bye. 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 Cheers.